And welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. That was fast, right? It was so fast. Welcome Jessica Cardenas, Morgan Martinez, Victoria Pierce, all of our online learning students. Welcome to Baldwin Beauty School's Distance Learning Salon Ecology Part 2. Welcome, you guys. Hey, hey, Lauren G. Want to see you guys do your thing right now. Go ahead and clock in. Time in. Let me see who's here. Lana's in the house. She's taking a roll call for me today. That that little time went by so fast. Hopefully you had a chance to catch up and do your notes from the first live. And if you didn't, it's okay. Just you know, rewind, get the notes. Hi, Molly Roberts. Taylor Campbell, Sam Sladish, Ashley Dukes, Yasmin Collin, Reagan Allen, Victoria Pierce, Amber Amanda. Hello, guys. Taylor Campbell, Hannah Broadway. Hello, Hannah. This is so different from teaching in the school. We went back to school last week. I have to say that I'm so happy not to be wearing a mask. My face is not hot and people can see my facial expressions. Hi, Chloe. Alexia La, Alexia Lazo. Yes. It's been a while since I've been on a live, so forgive me for my rustiness. Hopefully you were able to join in to the first live and um, get the notes from that because this is going to be a continuation. You will have assignments to turn in, worksheets to turn in. We hope you guys are enjoying our school. Hi, Leslie. Leslie's been in and out. Those of you that are doing um, in, in building and lives, just remember that this is the theory part, that the in-house comes with the hands-on. So if you want to do the hands-on, Probably going to have to make a, an appearance in the building. All right, Stephanie Sheely. Hi, Stephanie. So nice to meet you. A self baby. I'm going to be your new mom. So, hey. Valerie De Los Santos. Mercedes. Hi, Mercedes. Hello, everyone. I'm going to give you guys another minute to clock in. Demaya, Mary Helen, hello ladies. And we're going to continue on with our distance learning part of Baldwin Beauty Schools. Those of you that like me, please give me a big thumbs up. You know, give me that thumbs up button because we realize that distance learning for some students is a lot harder but necessary. So make sure that um, you're giving me a thumbs up and making sure you're taking notes. I'm gonna go ahead and give you guys a chance to gather pen and paper or just continue from your pen and paper and then I'm gonna do my setup, my usual. And y'all know the drill, I like to write notes. I'm kind of fast so if I go too fast, just. Tell me, and I'll slow down a bit for you. My handwriting is not always on point, but you know, I try. Hopefully, you can see my whiteboard. Oh, there we go. It's almost like a, a Okay, can you see? Where's Waldo? Okay, so in our 
Live before this one, the nine to ten, we talked about infection control bacteria. We talked about the classes of bacteria. We talked about the types of disinfectants, the hospital grade disinfectants, tuberculocidal disinfectants, what they do, and they destroy um, bacteria and fungus and viruses on surfaces. So if you did not tune into that live, that's perfectly fine. You can always go back and look at the information, write it down. Um, we also talked about the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, um, and the registering of all disinfectants, which has a number. Um, the hospital grade ones, they're effective for, you guys remember, what are they effective for? The hospital grade disinfectants are effective for, let me see in the live chat, those of you that were on, you should know that. But some of you that weren't on, maybe you could answer. Hospital grade disinfectants are effective for cleaning what? Blood spills. Yes, Lauren G. Yes, honey. Blood spill and what else? Come on, I gave you two answers for that. Bodily fluids. Yes, Chloe. Excellent. So then you have your tuberculocidal, pseudomonocidal, you have all of those different types of disinfectants that you have to learn. And then we talked about um, how bacteria is transmitted through sneezing or coughing. Um, the state regulatory agencies, OSHA, you will have an assignment that will involve OSHA and to watch videos so you can truly understand why OSHA is a very important part of one of our agencies to regulate the types of disinfectants we use in salon, spa situations at home. Sometimes um, it has to be safe to consumers, has to be safe to pets. So you'll learn the difference between what the laws and the rules are for that. Um, then we talked about bacteria. Which bacteria, I'll give you a little pop quiz, which bacteria causes Strep throat. You guys know that. I gave it to you last time. Give me, give me the bacteria that's found on the surface or something that causes strep throat. Y'all know? Let me see. Which one? Which one? Which one? Coxie, yes, that's the Coxie. All right. Look at y'all, look at y'all learning and stuff. Very good students. Strep, streptococci or coxy? Coxy, you're gonna learn the shape of it. I already tried to draw it for you. Gave you a little information on that. And now we're gonna go into, I didn't get to, uh, a chance to do this with you in the nine to, 10, so we're going to talk about a little bit more about bacterial reproduction. So you can understand how important it is to clean your tools and materials every time you come in contact with a client. Bacterial reproduction is also known as binary fission. And that's just a fancy term for how germs last and get together, how they reproduce, okay? Knowing how bacteria grow and divide, um, we have to know that in order to stop it before it happens. Because the more they grow and divide, they multiply and they spread, okay? So you gotta know the types of bacteria so that you can arrest or stop the binary fission. And that's how scientists cause cures or create disinfectants. So we have our disinfectants. We have barbicide, which was what we use in salon and in beauty schools. And there's also different types of disinfectants. The binary fission of bacteria is very important because this is how it grows reproduces 
and invades. The longer a bacteria stays on the surface, the more chances it has of infecting someone. So if you can arrest that, if you can stop that by cleaning an implement, by washing your hands, by sanitizing your chair, by sanitizing the shampoo bowl, you can inhibit the binary fission process. Anything that grows and reproduces or multiplies is going to be more dangerous to you and your client than if it's arrested early. So that's important to know. Let's give an example of, bi of, of bacterial reproduction. I'll leave that up there, and I'm going to give you the nasty example so that you can understand. I'm going to give you this word. That word, sorry, my little spray, it's biofilm. Okay, biofilm, y'all know what that is. And if you don't know what it is, I'm going to give you the gross definition of it. And I'm going to tell you, when you wake up in the morning tomorrow or today after a nap, I want you to run your tongue across the front of your teeth after not brushing your teeth for a few days or a couple of days. Okay? It's the slime that is created when, uh, when bacteria and water are present. So biofilm, yes, that's why you got to brush your teeth every day, stinky breath people. Especially if you're a smoker, if you eat foods that have a lot of pungent flavor to it, you need to brush your teeth more often. So, biofilm is a type of slime, not the word they use in the book, slime, slippery. That is created Underline, underline that word colony in the water are present in the water in this case is your saliva okay this is the substance that's in your mouth so people who don't regular, regularly brush their teeth or use mouthwash are going to have a tendency to have more bacteria build up, which is going to cause bad breath. All right. So the biofilm is a type of slime that is created when a bacterial colony, and this word colony is important. What that means is people that are there to stay. Okay. So what happens is the saliva has that foundation or that sticky substance for the bacteria to adhere to. So the colony just multiplies over and over. And the water is when you rinse your mouth, you drink water, you drink a soda, or you drink coffee. Okay, everything has water in it are present. So what that does is that binds to that biofilm and it makes it harder to remove. Meanwhile, you have a bacterial colony, which is going to cause gingivitis, which is going to cause some kind of gum disease, maybe bad breath, halitosis is another... Um, you know, but what happens is it becomes sticky and the nature of the colony adds to its growth. So because it's sticky, it adds more bacteria. That's why you should never, ever use mouthwash without brushing your teeth. It's because of that one, two punch that this colony is affected and the biofilm just adds on to itself every day. It's difficult to remove and then it turns into dental plaque. It's what they have to scrape off of your teeth over time. Pretty gross, huh? Pretty gross. Yeah, that's gross. So that's a bacterial reproduction at its best. And you're gonna be asked about this. So when someone has that in their mouth and then they sneeze on you or they drop saliva somewhere, that binary fission is still present. That, that bacteria is still present in your mouth. Okay? So we have to in practice. Sorry. 
infection control. And that's not after we do it. We have, after we get it, we have to practice it in order to keep it. And I used to not think that this was important when I was a student. I thought, oh yeah, as long as I wash my hands and clean. No, infection control means more than that. What it actually means is to eliminate or reduce the transmission of infectious organisms. So you're gonna write that down as your definition. To eliminate or reduce the transmission of infectious organisms. That's why we sanitize, we disinfect, we sterilize because of all of the bacteria that are found on surfaces. And those organisms are bacteria, streptococcus, tycho, all the bloodborne viruses, bloodborne, okay, fungi. Fungi or fungus. And parasites. Left untreated under certain conditions, these all can cause infectious disease in our bodies and in our daily life in clients. Anybody that wants to chime in, talk about it. Let me see what y'all have to say. Chime in if you know someone who has one of these viruses. We're going to talk about that. Viruses invade the body because they're different from funguses and bacteria. Let me read y'all's typing in answers. McDee, McDee, oh hey McDee. So tell me, tell me something that you have not known or that you've learned today that you you're gonna do in your daily life as far as going forward with your infection control procedure for at home and for at work. Lauren G says my friend is convinced she has a parasite. Okay, Lauren Garbidian, what parasite? Does she think she have itch my lies? Because that's a parasite. <sighs> yeah, it's it's serious. And a parasite doesn't necessarily have to be on the outside. It can be on the inside. There's inside parasites. So we're gonna learn about those as well. Oh, yes. Yes. People have a lot of parasitic bacteria that's, in, that's found in their gut, that's found in their digestive system, that's found in, and that's what makes people who have um, what we call, um, uh, it's, uh, I forget the name of it, where every time you eat or everything you do, your stomach is unhappy about it. So that is a parasite, absolutely. Mary Helen says, I'm brushing my teeth every 20 minutes now, yeah. Victoria, I struggle with tinea versus, oh wow, tapeworm, yes, oh my gosh. And you know, sometimes it's one of those organisms or one of those bacteria that 
there's no cure for it. There's no antibiotic for it. You can treat it and keep it from making your life miserable. But if you know somebody with um, like Crohn's disease or colitis or something that causes their digestive system to be out of control, chances are it's some kind of organism of bacteria. All right, so this is why we need infection control. I'm going to move on now to the next one. All right, so we talked about infection control. Let's talk about hand washing. I want to go back to that. Um, you want to do proper hand washing? I'm just going to give you a step-by-step -step because sometimes people don't know. I went to the grocery store this weekend and I watched two little girls leave without washing their hands. And they didn't have masks on or anything. And I just remember thinking, wow, thank goodness you guys are young, okay? Um, but somebody needs to teach you how to wash your hands every time you, you go to the restroom or you handle food or you go, because I know that that's like a bad sign. And when I see kids doing it, I think it's like, okay, that's a learned behavior. Okay, what I want you guys, if you don't take anything away from what I'm teaching you, is hand washing, okay, is the first defense to infection control. It's the primary. If you don't wash your hands, you need to start. Because most infection comes from us, right? We're infecting each other. It's not from our cat or dog, maybe it is. But the first offense of infection control, even if you wear gloves, is washing your hands. You have to wash your hands. After every trip to the toilet, after every shampoo, after every client, after everything you do that touches the surface, please wash your hands, okay? And we're gonna talk about the hand washing steps because a lot of people, uh, including children. So those of you that have children, they can watch this live and participate with you so they can understand that the first step is to turn on the water. Now, if you grew up in a household like I did, my mom used to say, don't waste that water. Don't waste that water. Don't turn it on first. You put that pump in your hand and then you love it yourself. No, you turn on the water first because chances are 10, 20, 15,000 other people touch that faucet. So you want to turn on that water first. Second thing you want to do is you want to pump your soap. Most places, businesses have a dispenser where it's touch free, where you can just run your hand. But if there's a pump, you want to pump your soap first with dirty hands. After you touch the faucet, pump your soap. Okay? You don't want to start washing your hands yet. Because then you're defeating the purpose. The third thing is after you pump your soap, you want to rub your hands together. And I do this vigorously. And this is before I even touch the water. I want to rub my hands with whether the soap is a foam soap or a liquid soap, rub it together so it gets all over, okay? Because what I'm doing is I'm creating a barrier of disinfectant for my hands, even the webs. They say that people don't wash in the webs of their fingers. So that that's where a lot of bacteria harbor. Rub your hands together with the soap on it, okay? Then you want to put your hands under the water. you want to use your water. Lather them, comma, lather. And then they say that you're supposed to do this for a minimum of 20 seconds. Now, CDC will tell you 40, 60, whatever, seen the alphabet, but it has to be more than two seconds. 20 seconds is the minimum, okay? Yes, people don't wash their thumbs. Sam Sladish, I cannot stand when people 
wear gloves in place of hand washing. Yes, it's, it really is so much worse, Sam. And you have a very good point there. People who don't wash their hands and wear gloves, what are they doing? They're just entrapping that bacteria in their fingernails and skin with the gloves on. So if even if you wear gloves, you still need to wash your hands. Okay, so here's number one through four. I'm going to go ahead and do number five. Okay, so a minimum of a minimum of 20 seconds. And then you want to use, so this is number five, you want to use a paper towel. If you go to someone's house, um, and they have a towel hanging in their bathroom, whether it's a bath towel or a hand towel that's for drying, do not use it. You want to use a paper towel, something disposable. And most places, most businesses will have that. Restaurants will have that. Once you use the paper towel to dry your hands, now water is still running, mind you. Okay? You're still running the water and people say, oh, you're wasting water. Yeah, you are. But you're also making sure that you don't get sick so you do it quickly. All right? Use paper towels to dry your hands. Then you want to turn off the water with the towel in your hand. Some places and a lot of places have automatic where it stops, okay? But if you don't, you want to turn off water with the paper towel. And the reason why is because you have germs that are harbored on that faucet nozzle. So you don't want to touch it after you wash your hands. Once you turn off that water, you can either throw your paper towel away depending on the door, but I usually use my paper towel before I throw it away to open the door. And then I dispose of it. Just, just an extra precaution. Yeah. Okay, so that's just hand washing etiquette. And a lot of kids will sing the alphabet if your kids know the alphabet. If you have kids, you know, small children at home. You can make them count to 60. Wash their hands the whole time. Same thing with brushing teeth. You want to make sure that they have enough time to make sure all of those parasites and bacteria get off. All right. Yes. And open that door with another paper towel, LOL. That's what I do. I grab another one. Door handle. Like, I love going to Rudy's Barbecue because they have that little door handle thing where you can put your, put your food under, foot under it and open the door that way. I think that's brilliant. Totally brilliant. Never have to touch the door. So now we're going to talk about parasites, organisms, still bacteria. Okay. I'm going to talk about um, that family member that's been living off you for five years. <laughs> no, not a parasite. They're actually mooches. They call them mooches. Um. Parasites are, this is the definition. You write this down.
So a parasite are organisms or organisms that grow, feed, and shelter on or in another organism or a host. Um, parasites do not contribute to, to the survival of that host. They take away a little bit, but they really don't take away much. Okay. Um, parasites must have a host to survive. Okay, so I want you to think about the types of parasites that are found inside and outside the body that must have a host. And I want you to comment in the live chat some examples of a parasite. Now, parasites can be external and internal. And we're going to talk about those um, after I erase this board. But give me some examples of a parasite. Lice, yes. Bot fly, tapeworm, yes. Tapeworm, Mary Helen, very good. Sam slash lice. And lice happens to be an animal parasite that lives on the scalp, all right? The skin. And the host is the person, a tick, fleas, heartworms, tapeworms, yes. Very good. And it's important that you know that all parasites, even though they're organisms, they start with what? Improper disinfection, improper cleaning, okay? If somebody cooks you a, a dinner, they go, oh, I wanna invite you over, cook you a dinner, and make chicken, they undercook that chicken. The parasite that's found in that undercooked chicken is go. Let me see. Wanna know, what is that undercooked chicken parasite gonna be? For those of you that are brainiacs. And I'm gonna erase and start the next. What is that undercooked chicken gonna contain? A parasite that's gonna make you sick. Salmonella, yes, very good. Okay, and if those of you that haven't had Salmonella poisoning, it's one of the worst types of food poisonings you can ever get. That's why if you cook, you need to make sure your meat is either overcooked or cooked to a certain internal temperature. Okay, so the first type of parasites are internal. Internal parasites are acquired um, by eating fish or meat that is improperly cooked. It's usually found ground beef, but it's also found in some fruits, depending on how it's harvested. I remember people who weren't able to eat cantaloupes for a while because of the salmonella. Okay, then you have your external parasite. And that is going to affect humans on the skin. Or pets. Dogs. Usually these are mites, lice, ticks, fleas. And all of these need a host in order to survive. Without a host, mosquitoes, they cannot survive. So, a parasitic microscopic particle that affects the cells of a biological organism. That's what it does. 
So it, it, it feeds not just off of your blood, but off of your cells. If you get sick from food poisoning, make sure you get proper treatment. Sometimes your body will just get rid of it and you'll run its course, but make sure you get it uh, treated. All right. Parasites. A virus is also a parasite that lives inside. We're going to talk about the differences between viruses and bacteria. And someone says, I have a stomach virus. Usually that will be accompanied by nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. It's not something that we, we haven't had before, but it's caused by a bacterial infection in our gut. Okay, we've all been through it. Our kids have been through it. Um, so the definition of a virus. Parasitic. Sub-microscopic, that means even under some microscopes, you can't see it. It's so small that it can get into our cells. virus is capable of replication and that's how it's able to spread Parasitic parasite particle that affects the cells of a biological organism, which means a human or an animal or another living thing. Um, it's capable of replication of the cells of the host, and that's how it's able to survive and multiply. It gets into the reproductive part of the cells and it's able to manifest them, take on their make up and then divide with them. And that's why viruses can only be treated by antibiotic. Certain viruses like a stomach virus um, are able to withstand the body's own natural defense and the body will get rid of it. A lot of times your doctor will tell you if you have a stomach virus, you can get a prescription that will help. The antibiotic will help, but the symptoms are still there. So it's really, really important that those of you that are one of many people who feel like it's okay to share food and bites of food and drinks of food, stop doing that. Because this is detrimental to your biological makeup in your gut. Because all it takes is one introduction to one of these parasites into your gut to cause you a lot of problems. So I know, you know, we love to drink after our kids and our kids will pick up our cup, but please make sure that you're not sharing drinks and sharing food. If you do prepare food or if you do share food, make sure you separate it um, and that you're practicing good health standards. Victoria Pierce says viruses are unique in that they are a living microorganism without a nucleus. Yes, very good, absolutely. And somebody might have a stomach virus and not even know it and be like, oh, I can't eat the rest of my Chinese food. Here you go. And you won't even know it. So don't share food. Don't share anything anymore. Okay. 
Let's talk about the differences between viruses and a bacteria. Let me erase this. As we talked about bacteria, we know that a virus can be blood borne, it can be gut borne, it could be everything. Okay. Um, the difference between a virus and a bacteria is that a virus can live and reproduce only with a host. Okay. So I'm going to write viruses need a host. They need a living organism to survive. And even though they're out there, bacteria, this is different, can reproduce on their own. Without a host. Okay. Viruses have to take over other cells in order to live and reproduce. Bacteria can live on the surface and reproduce on its own. And that's the difference between bloodborne pathogens, okay, like um, HIV, hepatitis, as opposed to staph infections like impetigo or pink eye. Viruses are unique, yes. Y'all are listening. Okay. Am I going too fast? Hopefully I'm not. I'm erasing now. Now we're going to talk about immunity. Okay, so we talked about parasites, immunity. Hopefully I'm writing things up where you guys can see. Immunity is the ability of the body to destroy and resist infection. There's two types of immunity. And really and truly, a lot of us, especially children too, or people with pre-existing conditions, are immune to most diseases that are communicable. That's why people who have a lower um, immune system, who are elderly, who have a pre-existing condition, have to make sure that they're not around a bunch of people who even though they might think they're healthy, they don't want to compromise their immunity. Infection is everywhere out there. And nowadays, you have to really be careful. So there are two types of immunity. The first one is natural immunity. Natural immunity is partly inherited and partly developed. And the way it's developed is through a healthy lifestyle. I'm gonna put that in parentheses. Okay, and what people consider a healthy lifestyle is subjective. So a healthy lifestyle means you don't smoke, um, you don't drink to excess, you get some kind of exercise, you eat, 
a certain amount of calories or a certain amount of foods that have nutrients that are good for you. You don't always, you know, take the low road when it comes to your health. So that's, that's a combination. It's inherited because some people have a natural immunity to certain diseases. They can be in a room with somebody who has a cold and not catch that cold because of their lifestyle or their inherent lifestyle. So that's natural immunity. The next one is acquired immunity. Acquired immunity is immunity that is developed after overcoming a disease. or through inoculation. And inoculation um, is exposure or a shot. So for instance, if you want to combat the flu, you have a flu shot every year. It's recommended that people who are over a certain age or have pre-existing conditions get a flu shot so they build a natural immunity um, to the flu if they were to be in contact with it, if they were exposed to it. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Some people are different. Um, immunity also pertains to allergies. If you have allergies and you're exposed to a lot of the things you're allergic to, like pollen and dust, then you develop an acquired immunity. And that's just because your body just builds up a tolerance or some kind of defense for that particular thing that might cause you to sneeze or cough or have itchy eyes. A lot of people that are from different states have said, oh, when I moved to Texas, I got over all my allergy problems. Yeah, well, because you were exposed to the pollen and the mold and all of the cedar and all of the stuff that comes with living in Texas. So most people from Texas, they have an acquired immunity to that. All right. Do y'all have any questions or statements or additions to the lesson from the chat? Please feel free to comment if you joined in late. It's perfectly fine. You're going to be able to rewind this and catch up. Yes, Mary Helen says, I didn't have allergies before moving here. Yeah. Some people don't, but this is a good place to live. If you do have allergies, they're going to kick your butt. Some people get over them, some people don't. But the more exposure you have to anything, the more of a resistance your body naturally will build. All right. So we're almost at the end of our live today in the last notes. I'm going to give you... We're going to talk about decontamination. Again, we talked about bacteria and viruses, and now we got to get back to the basics decontamination. Um, there's three stages that you have to learn as an esthetician, as a nail technician. Decontamination is relative to all of um, our learning and what we do and just to keep again yourself healthy and your clients healthy it's so important i know we sound like 
broken records when we talk about clean your station, clean your this, clean your that, make sure you do this and make sure you sanitize. It's not that we want to stress you out and make you feel, you know, uncomfortable, but we have to remind you that the stages of disinfection are important in a salon setting. So there are three main stages to decontamination. And the first one is cleaning. Doesn't mean moving something from one place to another, but cleaning actually removes all visible debris. And when I say visible debris, when you do a haircut, your shears will have traces of hair particles. Okay, that's a visible. Removes all visible debris, and then it reduces the amount of pathogens on a surface. Normally, it does not kill, but it reduces. Kind of goes back to the analogy of brushing your teeth. Um, you wouldn't use mouthwash without brushing your teeth first. So if you don't clean your implements first, then you might as well not have even gone to the second step, and that's disinfecting. So cleaning the implements means if you use a clipper, you have to brush all the hair of the clipper. You have to wipe it off, and you have to make sure all of the cleaning, all of the visible debris is gone. All right, same thing with hairbrushes, roller, uh, rollers, um, the necks of your, your cape that are sometimes vel Velcro, they have hair on them. You gotta clean them, you gotta remove all of the hair. Second thing you have to do is disinfect. Disinfecting removes or kills contaminants on a surface. That's not that right. Okay, so if I wash my hands cleaning, I'm removing all the visible debris, and then I use a hand gel sanitizer, I'm disinfecting. It's killing the contaminants and bacteria that I might have under my nails or on my palms or in the webs of my fingers. One and two have to go together in that order. It is no way around that. So that means if you have to buy a couple of extra brushes or a couple of extra all-purpose combs or a couple of extra cuticle nippers so that you can properly sanitize the ones you move, the ones you use on the client, then you do that. You don't just use it over and over knowing it's dirty and not caring about that. That is a huge thing that we have to overcome in our industry. Okay, and then number three, I'm gonna go ahead and erase one and two. Hopefully you wrote it down. The third, Level of decontamination and sterilization. We have an autoclave at the school. I gotta show you steps on how to use it, but sterilization is the process. That completely destroys all bacteria, even spores. And remember, spore-forming bacteria are in the non-active stage, so they they have a wax-like barrier over them. Sterilization kills that, and it's high-pressure steam. So that waxy, 
shell that it has gets melted and then the bacteria is killed immediately. Disinfectants don't work for spores. That's what you have to remember. So sterilization is gonna be your strongest form of decontamination. There are certain items that you can sterilize. Countertops are not one of them, okay? Your, your, your all-purpose cones, you cannot sterilize them. You have to, what, disinfect them. So sterilization is gonna be for your metal implements, your cuticle nippers, okay? Your um, metal implements that require infection control to a top level because you come into contact with blood or body, bodily fluids, your shears. If you cut someone, you can sterilize your shears. It's not recommended to sterilize um, any types of porous material such as nail files or emery boards or um, any product that could disintegrate under the sterilization. A lot of salons do sterilization, but they do it at the same time. So what I'd like you guys to do is you are going to have an assignment to watch videos that are going to discuss OSHA and their laws and regulations on how to sterilize and the types of um, requirements and rules that you have to abide by in a salon. There are certain items that are disposable, like your wax sticks. You wouldn't use a wax stick over and over on the same client. Okay, they have disposable items and then sanitizable items, so single use and sanitizable. You need to make a list of those. Um, in the video, you're gonna watch you're going to see what OSHA does. You're going to be able to tell me and your assignment a little bit more about OSHA. So what I'd like to do is take these last few minutes to read your comments. Demaya, do we send in the notes? No, you do not have to send in the notes. All you have to turn in is your assignments. And that's going to be due at 5 o'clock. You can just turn them into the Baldwin Beauty School assignment email. And um, just keep your notes. That's going to be for your notebook and everything that you have to turn in upon your arrival to school. Hopefully you guys took notes. Yes, the first assignment, you can draw the images. Absolutely. And you can label them as well. Um, feel free to get creative. I always like to see assignments that are creative and artistic. Doesn't have to be perfect. Just, you know, a little bit of uh, creativity. Regan says, is there an assignment from 9 a.m. segment? No, Regan, there is no assignment. Actually, you um, have an assignment to do if you would just look at your email, but it's really the notes and we're just kind of going over um, the different um, curriculum that I have to teach you. But there is some worksheets if you look at them. And if you can't print those out, that's fine. You can just draw them. Um, but check your email. April, if you've already done it, when you first started distance learning, you still have to turn it in for the, yeah, girl. Even though if you've done this before and it's a repeat, you still have to turn it in for the credit. So if it's just the same thing, then just turn that in, okay? Um, again, you know, theory is going to come around and around. And those of you that have been on for a while, you might get the same information, but you still have to complete the assignments. And we try to make them a little bit different each time. Yes, you can make it into one page. All right. And don't, don't overthink it. You know, you guys just think about the notes, think about the drawings, think about Spirilla and Basili and Coxie and all of that. Um, you can watch the YouTube videos. Yes, absolutely. Any type of um, images that you need, any type of curriculum that you need, reference materials, you can always go back to all of our videos 
at Baldwin Beauty Schools. Yes, it's a good refresher, I know, right? Never too much to do salon ecology. It's always something you can learn and do over and over and over again. Wash your hands, get a good lotion. My suggestion, you're gonna be washing your hands and sanitizing your hands a lot more than you're used to doing. Um, the email, the YouTube videos, yes, it's actually not, not going to email you the video. They're going to give you the link and you're going to watch the video, Alexis, or maybe, yes. So check your emails, go to that link, watch those videos. Yes. Oh, they did email them. Okay, perfect. So Monica H says, yes. All right. I'll see you at three, Mary Helen. Let's go ahead and do a final roll call. Let everybody time out. Yes, I miss you too, Big D. You're welcome, sweetheart. Thank you guys for tuning in. Hopefully you learned a lot with me. And um, Stephanie Sheely, welcome, sweetheart. I'll see you on Tuesday. If you're not coming into the building, I'll see you soon. Chloe Lung. To Maya Monet, Reagan Allen, Monica. Bye, you guys. Bye, Marion. Bye, Molly. See you. Hopefully, you guys um, get a chance to go over your notes. And, uh, yeah, learn all you can from us. All right. I'll see you for the last live soon.